this is another lesson from my free complete C Sharp programming course. Uh, over four hours of video lessons, which you can join absolutely free at bitwisecourses.com. And this lesson is all about C Sharp generic collections. Earlier in this course, we looked at arrays. That's a sequential list of objects. Now, the .NET framework has another sort of collection called a list. A list is called a generic. A generic list is a list that's strongly typed. And here's how I've declared one to hold objects of the type thing. You see, I've declared it list, then I've put the class name between the pointy brackets, and then I've called the constructor again typed to hold a specific type of object. Now, one of the advantages of this sort of generic list is, if you turn to the documentation, that it comes with a great many methods for handling the items in a list. And I'd strongly advise you to look at that documentation to understand all the ways that you can manipulate a generic list. Now, in the generics solution, which you'll find in the code archive, you'll see a few examples. Here, I've been able to count the items in a list and to add an item while well, I add a new thing object. And my list is typed specifically for thing objects. And another useful feature is that once I've got a strongly typed generic list like this one, when I iterate through the items using, for example, a for each loop, I can use the methods or the properties of each thing item as here with the th.name, th.description, without having to cast or coerce the items to the thing type. So by declaring a generic thing list here, or it could be other types such as string or whatever objects you're working with, the list provides a whole range of methods and properties that are ready for use with the specific type of things in my list. So it's worth getting to know generic lists. Sometimes it's useful to have lists that can be indexed not by number, not by an index such as 0, 1, 2, 3, but by some other sort of value. And you can do that using dictionaries. And again, if you look in the generics project, you'll see I've created a dictionary. This is declared in a similar way to list, except this time, between the pointy brackets, I put two items. The first one declares the key type, and the second, the value type. Now, a dictionary can be thought of a bit like a, a real-world dictionary, a book with definitions in, that you look up a definition using a key, and the key is the name, for example, dog. So you turn to the item labelled dog in dictionary, and then you'd find the value, and the value would be the description of what a dog is. It's a small mammal that woofs and eats bones. So a dictionary in programming terms is similar, and if you come from other languages, you might be used to calling them hashes or associative arrays. Now you can find examples here of how I've used a dictionary. So to add items to a dictionary, I specify a unique key, and in this case, that's a string, such as troll room, lair. And the dictionary that I've declared, the value is a room. So the second item for each element in the dictionary has to be a room object. And then when I'm iterating through the items in the dictionary, here I've got a for each loop, I can retrieve a key value pair. And this is the syntax for doing that. And then I can call the key and the value. And because the value is typed to room, I can call description, which is a property of room. So this is explained more fully in the course notes. And to get a better understanding of how this all works, of course, run the program. So, first of all, I'll click Show to see what I've got. OK, so my list and my dictionary currently are empty, so I click the Create List button and the Create Dictionary button, and, of course, check what's going on in the source code at this point. Show. So now my list contains some treasures, and my dictionary, that's the Dictionary of Rooms, contains some room objects. I can add something. I've now got a new room and a new thing. And let's try deleting something. So I need to enter a key. 
I'll enter sword and the delete button will try to delete a sword object from both the things list and the rooms dictionary. So the sword is not found in the room dictionary, not surprisingly. It is found in the thing list and so it's removed. So I can check that by showing. So again, look at the source code to understand how this is working. So let's look at the delete button click method. Here you can see the search name is just assigned the text from the text box on the form. And then I use this bit of code to find if the room dictionary contains the key. Remember that my room dictionary is indexed by strings, the key values, unique strings that are used to look up items. So if the text is found as a key in the dictionary, then I can remove the matching item. In the example I just gave, it wasn't found, so it wasn't removed. Now the next loop goes through the thing list, and this does the same thing. It tries to find the matching item, but it has to look up one by one the name property of each thing in the list. So to search for a string, that's quite a bit more work with the thing list than with a dictionary. Let's see one more example of this. Now let's look for a room. So I put in a room that exists this time, layer. That's the key into the dictionary. That's like the index. I have to be indexing using a string in this case instead of an integer. So now I can try to delete and it's found layer in the dictionary and it's removed the matching item. So I can show again and you can see that my room list is now minus the layer.